Welcome to Data Science Perspectives. This series focuses on analytics and data science professionals from across industry to learn about how their career unfolded, what skills they look for when hiring, and what trends they think are coming next. I'm your host, Bill Franks. Let's get to it. Welcome to this episode of Data Science Perspectives. I'm your host, Bill Franks. Today, I'm gonna to be joined by Brad Henderson. He's an Atlanta native uh, who currently serves as a Vice President of Data and Analytics for Work Capital Group. Now, a lot of you may not be familiar with Work Capital Group because the parent company itself doesn't do a lot of external branding, but I can promise you that you're familiar with many of the dozens of brands uh, that, that they own. These include Anytime Fitness, Arby's, Culver's, Dunkin' Donuts, Jimmy John's Subs, Mako, Massage Envy, Moe's Service Master, The Bar Method, and more. So a lot of uh, good portfolio companies and obviously analytics is a, a key part of what many of those uh, organizations need, which is where Brad and his team come in. Prior to joining Rourke, Brad had uh, been involved with Focus Brands, which is uh, one of the member companies within the Rourke portfolio uh, and is also based in Atlanta. Earlier in his career, he spent time with both UPS and uh, KPMG, the consulting firm. He's got a business degree from Georgia Southern and an MBA from the University of Georgia. And with that, let's welcome Brad to the show. Well, hey, Brad, thanks for joining me this morning on the show. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. This is a, this is my first podcast. Well, I'm sure you're going to do uh, you're going to do great here. It's uh, it, it's pretty easy, and I think I'll tee you up with an easy question to start. Uh, you know, you work work for Rourke Capital and uh, the parent company Rourke I, obviously isn't very well known and probably the vast majority of people wouldn't have heard of it, but I guarantee you that uh, people are very familiar with the large portfolio of companies uh, that you guys uh, have a stake in. So could you maybe give a little high level overview of, of Rourke, your portfolio and, and what you all do? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So Rourke Capital is a Atlanta based private equity firm um, we have roughly 25 billion in assets under management. Um, we do about 55 billion in sales and we have 63,000 units across, uh, uh, across our portfolio. Um, some of the big brands in the restaurant space you've probably heard of, they're uh, brands like Dunkin' Donuts, um, Jimmy John's, Sonic. And then in our consumer services and products, it's, it's, Brands like Orange Theory, Massage Envy, and Primrose Schools, just to name a few. Um, but we're, uh, you know, like I said, a private equity investor. We're, um, we're growth partners where we we partner with our portfolio companies and help them figure out um, how to add value, um, spanning a whole number of uh, of engagement models. What's well, interesting too, you, just in those those examples you gave, and I know there's dozens more. Um, I'm sure they have different analytical needs, even different levels of maturity around analytics. And as you at, at the uh, parent attempt to coordinate analytics across all of those various outlets, uh, I'm sure that must pose a challenge. What are some of the biggest challenges you face when you're trying to coordinate across so many disparate companies? Yeah, well, I'd say that the biggest challenge is, uh, is especially when it comes to analytics is keeping up with the pace of change. Um, across people, process, and technology. Um, things are moving so fast. Um, there's technology coming out, there's new data sources coming out, um, and there's new skills that are coming out as well, different programming languages, ways of uh, bringing all these things together. Um, and it's, it's really hard for organizations um, nowadays to, to kind of keep all three of those things uh, growing and aligned, uh, firms will, you know, uh, you know, pick a technology and bring that in house and where there's a lot of hiccups is, is thinking it's plug and play. Um, you really got to think about the culture. You've got to think about how people are going to be interacting with, with the technology. And then what does it do to the, you know, uh, to the legacy systems and decisions that have been made historically. So really at the end of the day, it's just keeping innovation, keeping up with innovation and how do all of these things play together? You know, it's interesting. One thing I guess I, I, I found intriguing is there's really two different aspects where analytics could come into play. Uh, and, and if you could just give a view, I, I think you play in both of these. One would be obviously analyzing the businesses that, that are in your portfolio. 
The other would be you're constantly, you know, buying and divesting uh, companies as well. Do you also get involved in the analytics to support those investment decisions as opposed to the day to day business operations? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So so the way we we started and how we have to kind of think about it, how we you know introduced analytics and, and to, into the firm. Um, we really started small, um, really just kind of thinking about, you know, what, what data and analytics means for the organization, um, how, how do we partner with our portfolio companies to help them make better decisions, and that's through best practice sharing. Um, what we found is once we really kind of got started and getting some really good quality data in and, and the investment team started to see the value in granular data sets and, you know, figuring out how to kind of pull that into the deal process. Um, it, the scope of what, where we focus now has broadened significantly. And now we find ourselves, you know, playing in all of the different areas of the investment life cycle, all the way to proactive sourcing of, of deals. Like, you know, what are the firms out there? What are the businesses out there that are aligned with our investment strategy? And how do we, you know, identify those coefficients or those variables that say, this is a really good business. We've identified it early in, in their life cycle, and let's figure out how to bring that into the portfolio. So um, we're now touching, you know, every aspect uh, of, the deal, of the investment life cycle. It's interesting. I imagine one of the most... Uh... Uh, painful, stressful, and intense work hour times is when there's a deal in play, because uh, I can only imagine that when, when a deal's in play, there's nothing more important or urgent to anybody around the organization, and you probably have uh, fairly compressed timelines and very high expectations to get those analytics out. It, w without a doubt, things move really fast when there is a, a, you know, a live deal and, and we're excited about it. So it's it's all hands on deck. And figuring out how to be nimble and uh, figuring out how to quickly problem solve, you know, the data and analytics value chain um, can add tremendous value in that, in that, um, uh, that decision time frame. Yeah. You know, given how many brands you, you've had the opportunity to work with over the years, given, you know, given that portfolio, um, Yes, you know, to your point earlier, you know, some are, are, are food or hospitality, some are, you know, more on the uh, health and fitness. You have some in the service sector. Are there any threads or themes you found are really common across all of them, even though they're very, very different that you just find here's some consistent uh, uh, analytical issues that each of our companies is really needing to address these days? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say, you know, the common thread that, that we're seeing is interest and focus on understanding the customer. Um, you know, it's really a lot of people say that, but there are real implications around how you leverage data and analytics to understand who your customers are and and how they're performing over time. Um, it's, you know, a lot of the data sources and systems that are currently in place within organizations are not geared, are not set up for understanding the customer. They're they're understanding, they're set up to understand the business or the unit level performance or the comparable performance of, of, of a unit, a location. When it comes to understanding a customer, it's not necessarily the same thing. The customer can go to multiple locations, can go to multiple brands. So you've got to really figure out, you know, how do you identify metrics and um, create a bridge between the financial systems and, and what the customer is doing? Um, you know, really at the end of the day, you're trying to figure out, you know, you're trying to tie everything to attribution or return on investment, you know, to create that, uh, you know, that virtuous life cycle of, of analytics. You know, if we invest here and do this, what does this mean for the business? So having that bridge between customer metrics and financial metrics is something that's really key. Um, but, you know, that's the reason why data and analytics is such a challenge today, because every organization is unique. And you've got to figure out how to stitch those systems together, um, uh, drive awareness and education and how that works um, um, so that everybody can get bought in on the, the outputs and the deliverables from information like that. And, and then everything starts to become very harmonious. Um, you start to see, you know, if I pull this lever here, 
what does that do for profitability? What does that do for my three year, uh, you know, customer life site, uh, lifetime value? Um, you know, these are the things that are really, um, you know, we're really focused on now and what a lot of firms out there are focused on. You know, it's interesting when you, when you give that perspective too, I hadn't thought about it explicitly, but really all of your businesses, even though there, you know, there's some disparate focuses of them tend to, if, if not exclusively be businesses where you're selling some product or service directly to a consumer via, uh, whether, whether it's an outlet, like a restaurant or a massage, uh, uh, location or whether it's, you know, a service you're calling in for service and someone's coming to your home. So, uh, but is, is that a common thread? Do you, do you particularly target those consumer oriented, uh, businesses or is that just, you know, more of a happenstance that they ended up that way? So when you say, or so within like an existing portfolio company or from an investment, like new acquisition standpoint, I just want to make sure I understand. Well, I guess by thinking both, most of your portfolio today does seem to be where there's something being sold to consumers like you and I, right? Yeah, and yeah. so given the, the heavy skew that direction, I guess, the, the, yeah, that's kind of the question is, is that intentional and that's what you've targeted or you, you'd be willing to invest in other types of businesses, but you just keep finding businesses that are compelling that happen to be in that uh, more you know, targeting consumer space? Yeah, so the, the, the short answer is we're doing both. Um, you know, we're, you know, we, we see how important digital is and in figuring out how to directly engage the customer um, through our existing portfolio that, you know, restaurants, we've got to figure out how to have that direct relationship within customer. But, but, but absolutely, we're, I mean, we're continuing to do that. We've done really well. From uh, from an investment standpoint on that front, but we are broadening the scope of our you know investments and getting more into membership models. So figuring out you know how to go direct to consumer, how to f identify you know reoccurring revenue streams from a customer standpoint, and you know it it really comes down to themes. You know what are those uh, those consumer themes that we're seeing start to emerge and and we anticipate growing. And then identifying those businesses early and figuring out, you know, what are those um, customer metrics that um, that enable us to kind of identify that and then ultimately grow it uh, over time. Okay. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and, and move a little bit more into you specifically in your background. You know, everybody, and I think you, you've experienced this as well. Almost everybody in the analytics and data science field came into it in a different way from a different angle, right? We all have our own story. So. How did you initially get drawn into this whole world of analytics? Uh, well, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, interesting. I wish I, I wish I had a story that was exciting and it was, you know, just worked out perfectly. It, it just wasn't. Um, I graduated 2006, 2007, you know, right, right at the, the beginning of the, the recession. So, you know, being 22 years old and, you know, trying to find a job was not easy. Um, it was actually really nerve nerve wracking. Um, I, I was very fortunate uh, to uh, have a conversation with UPS that they only had really one job. It was a specialist level job um, uh, in measurement. And really my job was, was uh, you, know, you know, have access to all of the data um, you know, direct uh, connections to all the servers. And, and my responsibility was to feed back to the marketing, senior leadership of marketing, uh, what was working and what wasn't working, um, to define that workflow, to understand how to make it automatic in a push of a button so we could see, you know, how products and services were performing week over week. Um, and, you know, getting into that job, I quickly realized I was underqualified. I, I was motivated, I was passionate about it, but I, you know, you talk about imposter syndrome yeah. and you talk about um, thinking you're gonna get fired every day because you don't know what you're doing. But yeah, I had about three years of that. Um, and what I found as I was going through that, that heartache, I was learning so much that at the time I just didn't appreciate because I was so, you know, I was just trying to keep up, um, but my growth from a from an analytics standpoint was just going through the roof um and i started to really see the value in what it is i was doing and i was able to see how important it was to the senior you know the senior leadership at a big organization like that and, and say you know that connection was 
I'm the only one that can really do this. Um, and it's really important insights that I'm feeding to the organization. So um, I'm just going to keep on doubling down on this career path and get better and smarter with, with data. And, and I've just stayed true to that for 15 years. Um, and it's just worked out really well. And now the rest of the world is caught on where, you know, being able to understand data driven decision making is, is, is table stakes for, for running a business. What's interesting, I think you, you you hinted at it a bit already in that lead up, but certainly there must be some specific skills or traits that that you have if you think about it. You know, what what helped you A be successful in that initial job where you felt you were in over your head, and then now obviously as you're proving you're not in over your head anymore, um, you know, uh, are translating to help you be successful even today now that you're uh, you know in a more senior position. Yeah. So, yeah. So it, 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 there has been a very consistent theme that a playbook that I've run personally, it, it's three things. It's curiosity, it's learning and perseverance. Um, if you are just constantly asking questions or you see something that you don't understand the, the, the best thing in, in data and analytics is double clicking root cause analysis, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and the good news is, is, you know, granular data technology that en enables you to see what's going on at a very lower level, what's going on beneath the surface and really just asking the hard questions and not letting anything kind of slide by you and saying, oh, I just don't understand that. I'll just move on to the next thing. But persevering through that pain of figuring out what is, what's, what's really going on. And as you, as you grow in data and analytics, that becomes a really, um, a really great asset or tool to have in your toolbox to be able to reverse engineer anything, to understand what's going on, and then ultimately to make it better. Um, you know, if something is broke, it's only going to continue to cause impacts or ripples throughout an organization. So being able to understand, you know, when something breaks, you can get to it faster. You can put in something that makes it better in the future and it scales. So um, curiosity, learning and perseverance are the three that I would say are just just you just got to continue to push on those. Yeah, that's great advice. It's funny. Yesterday I was giving a talk to a conference that was actually targeted at school kids up up through high school, which is unusual. I've not spoken to that group, but one of the one of the points I made to them is if you want to get into this field, you better be ready to work hard. And you and you better be you know committed to figuring it out because of everything you just said, right? It's not it's not the kind of job where you come in and you're handed the process flow and you just do it every day and and go home at five. It's uh, you know it's a lot of hard work to to identify the problems, work through the data, and, and so forth. And I think it's uh, at the same time very rewarding when you actually are able to work through those things. But it, yeah. at times, I think we've all sat there late at night wondering why do I do this to myself? This is uh, so, so crazy. Um, if you think back, what, what would be one thing if, if you had to name it that you wish somebody had told you when you were coming out of school and looking for a job before you started working that you, you know, now figured out, but that you wish someone had just told you. I, uh, so it's a, so the one thing I would say is, uh, I would say, don't trust me. Um, you know, because if you're asking somebody else, you know, in the analytics and technology space, if you're asking somebody else, um, you're already looking backwards. Um, going back to the pace of change and how fast it's moving, um, you've really, you've really got to think, you know, forward. You've got to use your own judgment. You've got to use a bunch of different data sources and trends to kind of anticipate what's coming next and how you can prepare yourself for what's coming. I'm, um, you know, going back to, you know, my days at, at UPS, if somebody had told me, you know, it's just, you know, continue to use Excel <laughs> to, to do reporting, um, I would have said, look, this, you know, that's not going to work five years down the road. There's too much information. It's moving too fast. Excel will never, never be able to keep up with this. Um, so it's really, you know, taking your own judgment, um, kind of thinking about what you're trying to do long term, but it's, it's really kind of figuring out the answer yourself. Um, so, you know, I would say, you know, don't, don't trust anybody outside of, of yourself and, um, 
try to be as self-sufficient as possible when it comes to making those big decisions about your career path. Um, and then anticipation of what you think the future is going to bring. So, you know, as you, as you look today and as your business expands, you're, you're obviously, uh, uh, certainly going to be doing, uh, even more hiring in the future. Are there certain things you're looking for most today? If you're, if you're hiring someone, whether just out of school or more experienced, right? What are some of the key things you're looking for and that work is looking for today in an analytical uh, talent? Yeah, well, another great question. So, you know, the, the thing with analytics, um, it's so new that, you know, you, you, there's not specifically one thing, like it's not a specific, specific competency that we're looking for. Um, you know, because within an, an analytics function, you, you could have different, you know, different roles, you data engineer, a modeler, a UX developer, you know, and there's going to be, you know, certain things that kind of, you know, you got to understand programming, you need to understand, you know, workflow development or validation, you know, there's you know, these inherent things you've got to, you've got to be familiar with or understand so you can, so you can communicate. But it, 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 in fact, it is the ability to communicate that I find is, you know, the one common thread. Um, being able to partner, understand the different um, areas of the analytics value chain, and then being able to share that information amongst individuals um, is, is really key. So somebody that, that understands how to articulate, you know, technical, uh, you know, technical language, uh, both amongst peers and then to people outside the analytics organization, um, because, you know, uh, one of the biggest challenges is, you know, when senior people want to really understand something, um, you've got to be able to do that translation from the technical understanding to what does it mean for the business or why? Why are we doing this? Why do we need to make an additional investment here? Um, so communication is, is really important. Um, and then really, you know, the other one is just, you know, passion or motivation. Um, you know, when I'm talking with, with students or I'm talking with, you know, um, more advanced hires, I, I want to get somebody that's not, you know, that's really curious and interested and, and that, that they've got a, a, a fuel that, that I want to learn more. Uh, and they're made, motivated to do it because um, I always find that, you know, an individual that has real motivation, um, but maybe a little bit under, you know, under tooled or under skilled, um, they'll figure it out. Um, they'll, they'll spend the extra time and they'll put the extra reps in and they will, and, and they will figure out the problem and figure out a way to overcome it. That's great. Yeah. Great insights there. I guess before we run out of time, I'll maybe finish off with a question about, uh, you know, as you look out three, five years down the road from today, what's, what's a trend you see emerging that you, you think, or maybe it hasn't even yet emerged, you just predict it will emerge, uh, that you think is going to be one of the biggest influences in the, in the field over the next three to five years? Yeah. Um, so the biggest, the biggest trend, I mean, the, I think it, it, it's hard to articulate plainly, but I think what I'm starting to see is that, you know, organizations like everybody has bought on to data and analytics as the future. Like everybody understands you've got to have fact based, fact based decision making, but how you go to execute when you've got established businesses that have, you know, have been relatively disparate and you're, you're trying to come together, you know, the organization is like, you know, kind of like the human body. It's, you know, you've got different, your body is doing different things, but they're all working together for a common goal. And if something happens here, you know, what is the implication over here? And this, that same, that same truth applies to organizations. So, you know, figuring out how to connect all of the data and all the people and really drive that alignment so that when you're making small decisions, you can see the ripple effect throughout the organization extending past the firewall of the organization to the consumer, you know, or, or client. But, you know, just really understanding at a granular level how um, everything you do, no matter how big or small a decision makes, is you know I think where we are going to head in the next three to five years with the ubiquitous ubiquitous nature of information and data and, and how everybody is focused on it, 
we're going to hit a tipping point. We kind of see it with all the misinformation out there nowadays. And there's really going to be a forcing function that brings truth together. And figuring out how to do that, I think is going to be, you know, it's going to be key for us as a, you know, a society to work together and businesses to do what's in the best interest of their customers and consumers more broadly. But how you stitch that together and understanding what little decisions, how it impacts a broader ecosystem, I think it's something we're going to see really start to take over here. That's great. And, and uh, Brad, I want to thank you. Your insights, I, I'm sure the audience found it really helpful. And I, I appreciate your time. So you know, thank you so much for, for joining me today and sharing your perspectives. Absolutely. Absolutely. This was uh, fantastic. Thanks, Bill. Thank you.